Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here, and Google for Entrepreneurs is such a proud partner mm -hmm. of Tech Inclusion, and we appreciate you coming out to join us today. Welcome, David. Hi, Mary. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's great to be here. It's fantastic community me. gathered here, and we're super excited to have a conversation. So, David, Good. you sort of grew up here in the Bay Area. You were born in Monterey, went to school throughout the Bay. Tell us about your first exposure to entrepreneurship and startup yeah. culture. So I, I, uh, I basically came to Silicon Valley when I was 18 to go to college, and I, I haven't left um, since then. So that was a very long time ago. Um, and uh, I, uh, when I got to the Valley, it really was Silicon Valley in the sense that it was about semiconductors, right? The, the right. companies that were thriving. But I did, uh, although I was a history major and kind of a straight up liberal arts person who wanted to go to law school from when I was like 12 years old or something, um, I noticed that there were these you know, companies that um, people were talking about that were you know, early stage of startups. And I read about the history of some of the semiconductor companies that started with three or four people and then became these big things with these big buildings. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting because it seems like they did that in a pre, you know, kind of a short period of time. Sure. So as I got sort of a little bit more interested in, in business, I started following the, the whole tech scene as it was, as it, as it was growing. And again, you know, then early 80s, this was uh, pretty much about semiconductors and a little bit of software. Yeah. So you caught the bug. Yeah, a little bit, but I still, you know, I mean, I, you know, I was a history major, so I, you know, I, I think I flunked my uh, entry level computer science class. So uh, I knew that that path was not going, it was not for me, at least at that point. So you became a lawyer. Yeah. Ultimately, you were at Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Rosati, which was also Google's outside counsel. So you first met our Google co-founders. Larry Page and Sergey Brin yeah. when you were at Wilson. Yeah, 1998. Yeah, it was the summer of 1998, so it was 18 years ago. And uh, so I got a call from a former client of the firm and said, hey, there are these two grad students uh, at Stanford um, who have some kind of search engine or something, and they're looking for a lawyer, so why don't you go meet with them? Um, and that was Larry and Sergey. So I, I met with them, and we kind of hit it off, and I set the company up for them and, and then joined uh, you know, a couple years later. Google's first lawyer. So what were your first impressions of Larry and Sergey back then? Um, well, they were like 24 and 25 years old. You know, I was a partner in a law firm, you know, so I walk into a meeting expecting that you know, I know everything, they know nothing. Um, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, they were uh, interesting because not only, you know, it was obvious they were technically brilliant, and by that time I had actually tried the search engine out, which, which I think was, st was still housed in their dorm room, mm -hmm. and it was actually already better than the other search engines that were available at the time. So I knew they had something going on on the technical side, but when you talk to them, they seem to have insights and understandings about business things, which is like, why do you know this stuff? You're only 24, like, you're not supposed to know this. Um, so, and, and they would challenge everything I said, right? So they were always like, not willing to accept the conventional wisdom. You know, I'm you no know, lawyer, I'm trying to say, well, this is how it's always done. It was like, why? You're like, well, we do it this way, why? So it was almost like, you know, people who have like, you know, two-year-olds or three-year-olds or something, they say, why, why? You know, that's kind of how they, uh, they were, because they just didn't accept the normal answers unless, until it made sense to them. Well, and that's what a, part of the reason I've loved the culture of Google so much, is this questioning of why and intellectual debate. And, you know, you joined Google 14 years ago, and you've helped be such a part of the fabric of building the company. I know from personal experience, because David hired me 12 years ago, and I've been privileged to work and learn from him for so long. So Google, and now Alphabet, has consistently ranked at the top of Fortune's 100 best companies to work for. Can you talk to us about building the culture of the company? What's that been like? What did you aspire to, to yeah. create when you set out? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the, you, you know, now everybody says this, right? That, you know, it's, you start a company to uh, you know, deliver avocados on demand and you're changing the world, right? Okay. Uh, but you know, I think at the time, you know, their view was, you know, we have this um, technology that might make it possible to get, uh, to, to provide access to information you know, that's on the internet, you know, more and more information is coming on the, inter on the internet to people all over the world. And like, how do we figure out how to do that? And they thought about a, maybe doing a foundation, they thought about maybe doing it as a sort of research project um, uh, at a university, but then they realized that the fastest way to get it out there would be to start a company. Uh, but that ethos, that notion of, look, we're, this, this whole project is about providing access to information was always the most important thing. 
Um, and I think that once, you know, when you got the initial core of peop, uh, you know, team together, as we started growing, you know, everybody came in with that kind of really believing in that mission. Uh, and, um, and, and it was very powerful. You know, we had, we fairly quickly came up with this notion of don't be evil, um, which was, you know, has been broadened to like, just, you know, be good at everything and philanthropy and stuff. But in, in initially it was all about users and always being, you know, you know, the person who's looking for the best information, the most objective information, uh, you always want to do right by the users. And you don't do evil things because at the time, lots of people were doing evil, what we regarded as evil things like, you know, tricking you into going to this site when you thought, you know, when the, the, the link said something else and, uh, you know, paying, you know, uh, letting people pay for search results and, you know, all these kinds of things. And so it was a, it was a very strong, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you, know, you know, stay true to the user. What I said before about, you know, thinking, you know, sort of being a contrarian and not accepting the conventional wisdom and then going big, right? So we always had this notion of, you know, most of us at Google who've been here for a long time are, are like kind of floored that it got to this point. Larry and Sergey are like, what do you mean? Of course, why, of course. Why, I mean, why, why are you surprised? Um, because they always had that, that level of ambition and the things we're doing now, you know, I work at Alphabet now, at, not at Google, but a lot of these things are, you know, we call them moonshots because they're, they're really big ideas that can impact lots and lots of people. And you know, you may not even make it, like you might not succeed in all of them, but the thing about thinking big is, you know, when you go after those things, a lot of times on the way, you, you discover something else or you, you, know, you, you do something that's really, really useful uh, and impactful. So I think that ethos of, of always thinking big and taking on big problems. Big and that we can culture. embrace failure, that failure is acceptable. Yeah, move yeah, on. it's okay. I mean, fail, as long as you fail fast, much better if you fail fast. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So looking back on, on your time, you've worn so many hats, you've built such large organizations. What has been your proudest accomplishment so far at Alphabet, Google? Um, I don't know, I, you know, one of the things, you know, I spent a lot of years and uh, traveled uh, around the world a lot, getting yelled at, um, and I think uh, by government people. Yeah, do you want to specify by whom? <laughs> uh, I'm not the Chinese government's favorite person, let me put it that way, but, um, you know, uh, and what we were fighting for was to, to kind of keep the, o the internet open, right, and free, so that people would use it as a platform for free expression, get, get access to the information that they really wanted. And it, it's not, it wasn't a foregone conclusion, you know, in 2000, you know, year 2000, let's say, that the internet would, would stay that way and would develop that way. And, you know, we had a lot of fights along the way around free expression, around fighting censorship, you know, fighting Hollywood when they were trying to close down things and, and lots of other folks. And I'm really proud that we've been able to keep it open uh, to make it more, you know, more information accessible uh, and make it possible for all these new platforms to, to develop, right? Um, you know, because it's a lot of that has to do with the regulatory framework and, you know, how governments are looking at things. You know, it wasn't obvious that you would have a system that would allow you to create Facebook and Twitter and, you know, and, and all these other great companies that have, have, have uh, spawned uh, from the internet. So uh, I'm really proud that, you know, I played a part in, in fighting, in, in sort of pushing that, that fight, which, by the way, is ongoing. Absolutely. Right? So uh, we all got to keep, keep that up. So on that note, on the policy front, yeah. you know, you've, you've traveled all over the world, worked with numerous governments. What is an example of a government, what, a smart tech policy that supports entrepreneurs that you think more governments should emulate? Well, I, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that the, the U.S. approach to uh, tech back in the early days in the 90s was the smartest. When they didn't do everything right, but they did a few things that were, that, uh, uh, that seriously, you know, led to the, the proliferation of, of internet companies, especially internet platforms. Things like, you know, immunity for platforms. So you're not responsible for everything that someone, you know, uh, all the content that someone puts up uh, through your platform, those kinds of things. Um, and uh, it's worked out really, really well. Um, and a certain amount of sort of a hands-off policy. Um, and I think a lot of governments are trying to emulate that. It's harder in some places, harder in Europe because of a lot of traditions and so forth. Um, that they have, but um, I, I still believe that the, the U.S. kind of got it largely right, although, you know, there's still a lot of things we, we could do better, um, and, uh, uh, and that's why you find a lot of people, you know, government delegations coming here and trying to figure out, like, what it is that, you know, that, that, that we did right. So I want to shift gears a bit and talk a yeah. little bit about your personal journey and inclusion, of course, the topic of, of this yeah. gathering. Yeah. So you've been in the tech industry now for over two decades. Yeah, close to three. But. 
Yeah. I was giving you a discount. Sorry, I'm, I'm all just <laughs> frack. So full disclosure. So what was it like for you yeah. in the early days, and what barriers or obstacles did you personally have to overcome? I mean, yeah. Look, I came out of law school, and I um, immediately joined this law firm that you know was worked with startup companies. Um, and look, I, you know, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me, right, running in and out of the, the, this 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 law firm, either the clients or the lawyers, um, and uh, you know, or venture capitalists or or anybody. So. You know, it was, I can't say that, you know, anybody was trying to stop me. I had a lot of help. I had mentors, you know, at my firm. People really looked after me. Um, but, you know, the, the lots of things where the people walk into the room with these assumptions. You know, it's, it's like, you know, you're, I'm in charge of a group of like 10 lawyers working on a big deal. And, you know, someone walks into the room from the other side and they immediately go to the junior associate next think who is a white male and like, oh, he's in, he must be in charge. It's like, no, I'm over here. Um, <laughs> And that kind of thing, you know. So, so a lot of people bringing these assumptions, um, and uh, you know. So I don't, you know. I think that um, you know, in some ways, and I think we're going to get into this a little bit more. But you know, I think you know, Silicon Valley, um, the tech kind of world has always been has reflects all of the problems, all of the biases people have in in the wider society. But there's a there's a kernel of hope there that I think maybe you don't see. Uh, in some of the other uh, other industries, because um, you know it is at the end of the day about like what you can produce, right? And you can cut through it if you do produce like something that works really well. Uh, and I'm not sure people at the end of the day, once you get to that point, people care so much who you are and where you came from. It's getting there that's very difficult. Right, the early barriers. Right, and you know so the early barriers people throw up because they're used to, you know, they're used to it. They're used to like dealing with people who look like them um, and uh, who act like them. Uh, and, and so forth. And those, those barriers are as powerful in Silicon Valley, despite a lot of talk of meritocracy and so forth, they're as powerful uh, uh, here as they are anywhere else. So do you think that, that tech is a meritocracy? No, um, no, but as I said, you know, I, I think um, it's got that, uh, you know, there's more, there's more room for data, information, and results to carry the day than maybe there is in some other places and some other industries. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Um, and still a lot of subject subjective evaluation of what you know somebody produces um, that you have to deal with. But um, you know, I think there's that that difference. But you no, know, the same kind of you know, as I said, biases and and uh, we have the same kind of issues, which is why we're we're here, right? And we're trying to change that and make this a more merit meritocratic uh, environment, so we can have all the talent participate to its fullest extent, right? And because that's going to make, create even more value and, and, and so forth. But I think you're absolutely right that tech is so data driven and yet we can't change what we can't measure. Yeah. So a lot of it begins with the measurement and how do we do that? How do we benchmark? Yeah, that's why it was so important for tech, you know, tech companies to come out and say what the numbers are. Like when we were having this diversity base, like, well, we're not going to make any progress if you don't acknowledge where you are, right? And, uh, and actually, you know, it was super important to get that out there so there's now some accountability, right? Transparency and accountability. So, you know, it's good that people are gonna like read that, you know, Google has, you know, small, you know, such a small percentage of black folks, Latinos, you know, small, you know, women. Uh, it, and so we say, so folks can put pressure on us and the rest of the industry because it's, it's that kind of pressure that uh, is, is what causes change. And so you were a big part of that decision internally at Google. We were one of the first, if not the first, company to release that data. What was that? Yeah, we were the first one. That conversation like internally? Well, no, it's a, it's a typical kind of a little bit of a corporate conversation where people are like, well, do we really need to do this? And you know, are we opening ourselves up to some kind of criticism? Or you know, um, and you know, you know, why don't we just quietly work on it? And and but no, I think what prevailed was no, no, that's not what we're about. We're about you know transparency. We like. Uh, to get the problems out there, you know. By the way, we're all about open open source, and you know, you know, letting you know the world work on problems and solve them. Uh, so you know, why don't we why don't we open source this a little bit, um, or you know, and crowdsource it a little bit, and get get uh, the input from people to help us solve this problem, given our position in the industry. So you talked about your early days at the law firm at Wilson Sonsini, and you said you know you did have mentors along the way. I definitely can underscore the importance of mentors in my own life. You know, you've been a huge, long-time mentor to me. Can you talk a little bit about 
some of the mentors or role models that you saw along the way who helped you? Yeah, I mean, there were, you know, at, at the law firm, there were a couple of uh, lawyers. One who is, is the, sort of the first African-American sort of senior lawyer in Silicon Valley who started with the firm, like, was like the third or fourth lawyer at the firm, which, you know, by the time I left was like 800 lawyers or something like that. Uh, he didn't do what I did. He was like a litigator or whatever, but he took me under his wing and, and really, uh, you know, made sure that I was, uh, you know, thinking about the right things and, and, and give, he gave me amazing uh, guidance. You know, the chairman of the firm, I kind of came up under him. I was uh, this guy named Larry Sonsini, and he looked out for me a lot and, uh, you know, made me work, you know, double all-nighters uh, <laughs> um, a lot. But, character uh, building. But exactly, character building. But, um, but you know, I had people look after, after me, and it's, it's super important. You know? So how do you think about that now, you know, mentoring the next generation, yeah. either at Google or, or beyond? What are some, some small or big ways that you try to do that and give back? Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, you just try to, uh, to, to be open uh, and help out. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to do a lot of it, um, but uh, to always be available, uh, you know, to try to, I try to do things that, too that will impact a lot of people, right? Because, you know, mentoring one-on-one -on -one is important, but if you can get out there and try to, you know, do things in a, in a broader, kind of broad-based way, uh, that's pretty helpful too. So we've talked about you know, explicit discrimination yeah. or, or conscious bias, yeah. but we also know, of course, that a lot of, of bias is unconscious. And you recently shared with me an anecdote that I yeah. thought was really compelling, a story about yeah. uh, you going yeah. to Uber. Can you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, unconscious bias, I mean, what we came to, the, we came to the conclusion at, at, at Google, and you know, lots of other people, have, uh, folks have come to this conclusion, that that's a really powerful barrier, right? And it's, one, it's not the only issue. Um, but it is a powerful one because people who are otherwise good and well-intentioned, who if you told them they were being sexist or racist or whatever, would think, would, would say, that's, you know, that's the absolute worst thing you could say to me, that's so outrageous, how dare you? Um, but yet they can be making decisions based on things that they don't really th reflect on and think about that have really negative impacts on folks uh, and that sort of keep things the same and, and, uh, and all that inertia. Um, and, um, and it stems from just, you know, people are used to, they pattern, you pattern match, right? And it's not always, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's rarely sort of, uh, you know, uh, affirmatively like negative or, uh, but it, it, it just happens. And so, you know, one example of, it was trivial, but, um, you know, I, I uh, until recently I've been, I was on the board of Uber and, you know, uh, one of the first meetings a few, couple of years, a few years ago, uh, I show up, this is when Uber was in a, one of their offices, the early offices, and uh, show up for the board meeting. And this is a time when uh, Uber also had the, uh, the drivers would come in, uh, you know, to for office hours, like to get, you know, you know, advice and get graded and, you know, all this stuff. So you would often have lots of drivers, like, sort of descending on the office, in the headquarters, right, in the office. Right. And so, you know, I go to the lobby and um, there's a security guard there, and the security guard's like, he looks at me, and he's like, oh, well, uh, the driver office hours is at three, right? So she just took one look at me and was like, well, that must, you, know, you must be here for driver office, office hours. Um, and I was like, well, no, I'm kind of here for the board meeting. And she's like, oh, okay, so let me up in the elevator. Um, and the interesting thing about it, the security, security guard was black, right? So she had the same, you know, same kind of, you know, well, there, there are different perspectives on that, right? right. And I think they're, they're a couple, I can think of a couple different perspectives on that, and they're both kind of valid, right? One is, you know, these kind of biases around black men and what black men are and aren't, you know, are very pervasive, right, um, uh, among society. But, but on the other hand, she was just, you know, whatever, you know, that was a pretty trivial thing, right? And she had control of, you know, who goes up in an elevator. But imagine when there are folks with power, right, who control much more important things, right, who, you know, who have these kinds of, you know, who, who make snap judgments like that based on stereotypes and based on things that aren't really, like, real and don't take the time to figure out, you know, what's real. Uh, and, you know, those folks are, for, for the most part, you know, white men, right, who get to make those decisions and, and so forth. And so I think that's why this, this, you know, this question of diversity, you know, is so important, right? Because we have to get more and more folks in who, have, who understand this, who empathize with, you know, this feeling and, and being treated this way uh, and, you know, understand, you know, 
you know, that not to do it and can reflect on it and change their behavior. Um, so it's pretty important. Or even for the people with best of intentions, understanding how to recognize our own unconscious biases. Yeah, yeah, we all have them. Sure, that's great. So racial justice, you know, huge topic, and I think technology has played a large role in amplifying yeah. some of the injustices and, and surfacing them. Can you talk a little bit about some of the initiatives Google is doing to forward racial justice? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got a, an effort to, to fund a lot of the great organizations that are out there uh, uh, working on criminal justice reform, uh, working on, um, uh, you know, what's the interactions between uh, police and, and communities. Uh, and, you know, so we're trying to use our, use resources uh, that we have to, to support those things. We're also working, uh, spending some time, there are a lot of folks at Google who are really, really fired up about this and really uh, want, want to bring technology to some, of the, to, the, to some of these questions, right? You talk about police shootings and so forth. You're like, if you're going to figure out policy solutions to this, you have to have uh, you know, some information about what's going on. And it turns out like, we don't even have the data like about how many they are under, uh, how there are under what circumstances. And that's crazy, right? And so um, we're, uh, we're spending a lot of time working on that internally and with some folks in the Obama administration and so forth to start, start figuring out how can we get more data available for this, more transparent, uh, you know, uh, have some transparency uh, on it, and then start doing the analysis that we need to sort of, you know, figure out what the right steps are, policy-wise. So shifting gears a bit, I want to ask you about the U.S. elections right around the corner. Oh, okay. So race, gender, certainly playing a very prominent role in the conversation. Yeah. You know, overall, do you think we're becoming more divided, more united? How do you see the conversation around race and diversity changing yeah. post-election? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to look at this election cycle and, and think that we're becoming more united, um, sadly. You know, and largely that's coming from one direction, as, as most of us know. Um, but I think it does, um, you know, it's, it's still kind of a, uh, you know, when, we're try when, when, when you're changing institutions, you know, whether it's a company, an organization, and certainly a country, these things are, we have the de demographic change that's going on. We have, you know, although we got tons and tons of work to do, more women, more people of color, you know, in, in, you know, in positions of authority uh, and, and so forth. And that's causing a lot of, you know, um, uh, reaction. Um, and uh, it, it's causing a lot of friction uh, from folks who aren't used to that, right? I mean, we're talking about having eight years of, you know, our, our first African-American president, you know, knock on wood, we're finally going to have a, a, a woman in the White House. And, you know, which is, and one of the things that's crazy to me, thank you, one of the things that's crazy to me is how little attention that gets, right, in this whole cycle. Now, you know, we got the guy on the other side who's sucking so much of the oxygen out of every last conversation that it's hard, but how historic this, this, is, gonna, this, is, this will be uh, if it happens. Uh, and how that's changed, how, what that means about changing the organization. Now it's like, you know, that we could have folks at the very top, right, that, that are, you know, a woman, African-American uh, at, at the top, and the promise that that holds for doing more throughout the rest of, you know, the country uh, for folks. But I think symbolically and, you know, and, me, you know, substantively, that's a huge deal. Um, and I think that, you know, what's going out, what's going on, you know, I think in, in, in politics right now, is you know about the country diversifying and not just diversifying as you know by the way like there was a period when the united states had more black folks than white folks right um, and so there's always been diverse numbers of people but we're talking about is diversifying you know authority and power right in, in the country and that's what's going on and so we have a, we got to work through that because there's still people who aren't used to that uh, and they've got to they've got they're going to have to get used to it uh, but it's going to take some, you know, some cycles and some elections like this uh, for us to get there. And hopefully, at the end, at the end, we can like, you know, uh, heal some of it and uh, and have a big enough coalition of folks who want to move forward so we can get it done. And we hope too that Google and the internet in general play a large role, right? Transparency of information. Yeah, I Google mean, you hope data. so. I mean, yeah, I mean, we all have this this sort of. Uh, you know, we have this view of the internet of like it's it's so the salvation of everything. But I mean, I'd say the internet is playing a, a pretty negative role, 
right in a lot of what's going on. It doesn't always unite people, it often divides people. Um, and, um, you know, and, and folks can utilize the platforms for, for good, but they can utilize them for, pretty, for ill as well. I mean, how much misinformation is out there, stuff that spreads around uh, on the platforms that people take as, as gospel and as true when it's, it's clearly stuff that's, that's false and is just being spread around for that purpose. A lot of disinformation. So I think we do have a problem, and all of us who work in the internet, we're, we're thinking hard about how we can work on this problem of authoritative sources, you know, where's truth, how do we identify what's true and what's not true, uh, and um, uh, as opposed to just, you know, we have these neutral platforms and, and so forth. So there's, there are a lot of big, really, really important issues, but uh, I think we all in our industry have to, like, the first, the first step is, like, to recognize that, like, you know, our platforms aren't always, like, you know, the motherhood and apple yeah. pie and the greatest thing ever. They have, there is a side to it and, and the use that can be, they can be, to which they can be put, uh, that's very negative. And we've got to think about how to deal with that impact. I want to open up to audience questions in just a couple minutes. So if you have a questions, please get them ready. Uh, one last question for you, David. So we have so many leaders in the room who are part of the technology industry. What, is, what do you think is the greatest challenge, you know, pressing challenge that's facing our generation of tech leaders? And one way you would give us advice on how to tackle well, it? Well, I mean, I'd say this diversity question is important, right? Um, because the, it's, at the end of the day, it's about talent, right? And this is, there's no other, I mean, this is, it's almost a creative industry. In, in, a, in a lot of ways, and um, and it's driven by you know folks who are good at stuff, um, and we have you know everyone else around the world is recognizing this, right? And there's talent all over the world, and once everybody's now connected, they have tools that they never had before uh, that they could use to build companies and get stuff done. Uh, and, and so forth, that there's a lot more, there's a lot of competition, right? And if we're going to continue, like in the U.S., like if we're going to continue to compete uh, globally, we better, we better damn it, you know, make sure we have everybody, uh, all that talent harnessed, sure. right? So in addition to this being a moral imperative, right, it is also a business imperative. Uh, and because uh, we got, you know, so I, I'd, I'd say that, you know, folks who are sort of sitting around you know, talking about, oh, the pipeline's not big enough, or, you know, oh, you know, we do outreach and we can't find people, and, you know, there are all these kinds of excuses for why your organization continues to look the same way it's always looked. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to break through that, uh, because if, if we don't, then uh, we're not going to continue to to create all these great, uh, these great companies. Let's work harder. Yeah. Great. So I would love to take audience questions. Do we have microphones? Mic or? Ah. Hi, thank you. Uh, what, is, uh, what initiatives is Google working on to address climate change? Uh, because we know with climate change, it tends to affect the, the poorest of communities here in the world. So I'm just wondering if you guys are working on any initiatives. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the biggest things that we can do is to make sure that our footprint is, you know, uh, is not negatively, you know, unduly negatively affecting, you know, the planet. And so we've spent a ton of resources in, and uh, done a lot of innovation to make our data centers, for instance, you know, efficient and, uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, reduce the carbon that we, you know, our carbon footprint. And we've done that dramatically uh, over the years, including, uh, you know, thing, and, and, and this is a big issue. Like, we have, like, millions of computers, right? And the, these millions of computers require power, right? And, you know, so how you generate that power, how you use that power is super, super important. So we've, all, we've always used alternative sources, you know, hydro, you know, et cetera, other things like that uh, to, to, you know, for generation and for cooling, right? Because it takes a lot of energy to cool the, cool the data centers and so forth. Um, so we've spent a lot of uh, time working on that. We've even lately, uh, recently applied, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence to to work on some of these things too, to sort of be more efficient, and that reduces a lot of that uh, that footprint too. So I think that, given, you know, our our footprint, given you know our, our computing footprint, we felt that was a big thing we could do. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Um, so my question pertains to um, the recently Project Shield came to the rescue in a sense. There was a really big DDoS attack from a blogger, a pretty prominent blogger, and he wrote a piece and some guys took him down. Um, but his security provider couldn't, couldn't 
just couldn't stop it, and you guys came in and did that under the uh, the Jigsaw Jigsaw team. And so my question here is, in that light, any chance you guys might put another bid on on Twitter? Wait, so the last part, what, what was so, that? So the bigger issue here is fighting censorship. You know, our voice, I can't think of a bigger platform than our voice. What you're um, and so my thought here is that Twitter's in sort of the need of a, of a, of a new home. And, and so I know you guys aren't on the table at the moment, but it seems like that could be a big. Are we going to put a bid on Twitter? Oh, well, I heard can, something can, about can, DDoS attacks. And yeah. then, so I thought that's where you're going. Then I heard a Twitter right. question. It wouldn't be your normal. Yeah, I mean, I don't, we don't have anything. I don't have anything to say about Twitter. Nothing. Uh, it's a great company. Um, but did you have a question about the DDoS attacks? That's the question. Any chance you guys would, would renew a bid? And look at it Sorry, again. it's really hard to hear um, the echo. I think the question is about Blogger. No. It's really hard to hear what your, your question. Oh, that part, yeah, I don't have anything to say about Twitter. The Twitter. That question. was the question, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, really enjoying the conversation. Can, can you hear me? Wow. Good a little bit? Or? Yeah. Okay. Just Maybe we'll have to bring one. everyone on stage to ask their question. <laughs> yeah, a question I just had is um, if you were um, talking to a young person of color, young boy or girl, um, they use Google because you know Google's everywhere, and so they, they like the program and all that, and they have some aspiring um, ideas of want to do it. But they're in a tough situation, you know, their upbringing or neighborhood or something like that. What are some words of advice, ideas, things like that that you would uh, tell a person? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it's a, I mean, it, I think there are more opportunities for folks to, there are a lot of folks working very hard to, provide, to get folks the chances to sort of apply their skills. Young, young people are so good with tech, right? So you have a lot of programs where folks are teaching folks in inner cities and everywhere to like code, do mobile apps and stuff like that, right? Because people, there's, kids are so adroit, you know, with technology. And, you know, so my, you know, my recommendation would like hook up with people, you know, first of all, school, education, right? But second of all, try to find, you know, the folks who are doing this because there, the, there are more programs than you think and more ways to sort of get some of these technical skills, even for very young people, you know, K through 12, uh, you know, to sort of learn about and get immersed in, in technology because so many of the folks who thrive in the technology industry do the, uh, you know, on the technical side got introduced to it at a super early age, right? And started coding and started being, thinking about things the way uh, engineers do uh, and uh, finding a way to get into that flow, right, somehow. Through school, although in a lot of places the, you know, unfortunately the curriculum isn't, you know, that great, but through these other programs that people are doing, and there are a lot of, there are a lot of great programs that I know that are, you know, that are present at this, this conference who are doing that. Um, you, okay. you talked about the barriers you experienced when you were um, an attorney, but can we go back further as a young person? What good things happened to you that set you up for success, and what were some barriers you experienced as a very young person? I mean, I, I think that the thing you know that set me up mostly was probably you know uh, just. You know, growing up, uh, my dad was an army officer, and you know, there was a lot of there was a lot of discipline, and you know, um, and uh, so made sure I was you know went to school. I was an athlete, but you know, I always you couldn't pry a book out of my hand, and so I think what set me up most most was you know being uh, uh, loving like knowledge and information, um, and you know, I look, I, I came up in in the seventies, you know, in a uh, and uh, in a you know, a, a, a place where there weren't, where I, where I lived, you know, not uh, in the school I went to, not tons of black, black kids. Um, so, you know, I got into my share of fights. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think the main thing that, you know, was, uh, you know, just like knowledge and information. And, you know, so that, that allowed me to sort of absorb stuff and figure out new things and learn and keep learning, right? Because, right? I, I, you know, it's, you're never, especially in this economy, going forward, you're not going to thrive just learning one thing and thinking you're going to do it for the rest of your life. Like, it's going to be transitions and new stuff you're going to have to learn to compete. 
Uh, thank you. We have time for one more audience question. Um, yes, thank you for uh, giving us this talk today. I'm um, with the National Science Foundation. One of the things that we're starting to notice is that the retention um, of students of color and underrepresented minorities in the STEM fields, whether it be the tech industry and doing startups or just staying through and in getting into an industry job and then going on um, in the workforce is one of our major issues and problems. And I just wanted to get your feedback and thoughts on how can we, ret we retain the talent that we're bringing in um, that are underrepresented minorities and women? Talent retention? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, that's, a, that's a big problem because it's one thing, you know, we've done a lot of things at Google to like uh, bring more, you know, people of color, you know, women in to the company. And I think we've been, you know, we got a long way to go, but we've made some good strides there. But it doesn't really matter if folks get there and, you know, they, you know, it's not comfortable, they don't feel comfortable about it, they don't feel like they're being treated well, they don't, you know, all of those things, and they're just, just gonna leave. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the unconscious bias things that we were talking about earlier. But, it, but a lot of it also has to do with, you know, I know that this, you know, people talk about taking your whole selves to work, you know, being able to be yourself at work as opposed to like some, you know, stereotype or some other model that appear, uh, you know, that appears to be the model of success. Um, so, you know, we're trying to, at, at Google, we've been doing a lot of things to support. We have, we're called employee uh, uh, resource groups. Um, you know, black Googlers, Latino Googlers, uh, gay and lesbian Googlers, you know, uh, and we support those groups because what those groups are doing is saying, hey, we have a community of folks who are like-minded and, and we're going to uh, be able to carve out a space here where we can kind of, you know, not have to pattern ourselves after somebody else, but, you know, uh, be comfortable in our own skins while, you know, working at this company and achieving things. And that creates more of a cultural level playing field, if you will, uh, for folks that um, yeah, to, to be able to, to do well. Uh, because otherwise it becomes this self-fulfilling, you know, people are feeling like, I gotta spend half my day worrying about like how I'm supposed to act uh, with people who don't get me, right? And then is my work suffering? You know, it's a whole thing, this baggage that I gotta carry around that other people don't, right? And, you know, that's, that doesn't work. And you're not gonna keep people around and keep people happy and keep them advancing through the organization when you have to deal with that. So it's trying to stamp that out. And, and, and part of that means exposing the rest of the company to that and make it, putting it in the, the face of the rest of the company as, as it were. You know, we've done some things like Google, uh, Google like, you know, we had a, uh, a, a march, uh, the, the hoodie march, we called it, you know, when the, uh, Trayvon Martin, the, the ruling uh, guy gets off uh, killing Trayvon Martin. And it was the day of our, uh, uh, we have a meeting called TGIF. So it's the whole company and the two founders get up in front of the company and, you know, answer questions and so forth. So it's the most visible kind of company-wide thing. We did the march right into the TGIF, right? And, and we're able to then make a presentation about what's going on, right? So it wasn't just like, oh, you know, black folks, other folks are just doing this little thing over here. It was like front and center in the company and putting that in. in. And I think, you know, lots of, lots of folks saw that and realized that, you know, the company's like willing to do things that make people uncomfortable, right? And you make people uncomfortable, then they start thinking, okay, I, I actually have to think about this. I actually have to focus on this. Um, and then I, you know, I, I, I think it, it gets better. Um, but those kinds of things I think are pretty important. So I want to end on a hopeful note, yeah. which is if we're sitting here five years from now at Tech Inclusion, it'll be 2021. What's your greatest hope for how we will have moved forward as an industry together on this issue? What, paint a picture for me, what does it look like? Well, I think that, I mean, it, the again, you gotta be data driven, right? And information driven, and um, it will look better. We'll, we'll know we'll, we're making progress if there are a lot more folks uh, in, in technology or a lot more people uh, in leadership positions, a lot more uh, diverse entrepreneurs getting funded and able to build companies. You know, that's how we can measure. It's not going to be hard to measure, right? I think the hard thing is going to be to get there and to, you know, to reduce these barriers, to get companies to, to focus on this, um, to do things that are edgier, uh, a little bit bolder, that you know, extend them out of their comfort zone, whether it's on hiring, whether it's on retention, employee support. Uh, or whether it's on like shaking things up in the organizations about, well, wait a minute, like the way you do this promotion cycle 
Is this having an impact, you know, a negative impact on women? Is this having a negative impact uh, on people of color? You know, being, you know, being willing to examine all of this stuff uh, and getting past this notion that, oh, well, if, if I'm doing anything, you know, if, if there's something I can change about, you know, uh, about, uh, you know, diversity, if there's something that, that I can change, it must mean that what I was doing before was racist or sexist or something, right? That's not true. You gotta, you gotta get past that right. and realize that, you know, sometimes things have unintended, unintended consequences and you gotta examine that, figure out if it's having those consequences and then fix it, right? And so I think those are the kinds of, the mindsets that companies have to get into to make the progress. But I think the progress will be uh, measurable and uh, we will definitely know it when we get there, but we have to get there. Well, thank you for all that you have done and are oh, doing to champion you. this in our communities and let's oh, hear it for, for David Drummond. Thanks, Drummond. everybody. Thank you.